TGIF, my friends. How is everyone doing? Have to put on my readers. Matter of fact, it's so bad I had to adjust the font size on my cell phone. I was constantly holding the phone way away and squinting to read it. Next thing you know, I'll have one of those jitterbugs. Woo, we made it to Friday. We made it to Friday, and burr, it's going to be cold this weekend. There is a cold front coming in, if the news is correct, the weatherman, out of North Dakota, where they're having snow already. Woo-wee. Looks like I'm going to have to find me some socks. And everyone knows how I feel about socks. But guess... Who started decorating for Christmas yesterday? She has two thumbs, a black cat, and hates socks. That's right, this girl. My husband goes, are you serious? I asked you to wait till at least after Halloween. I said, I couldn't stand it anymore. I couldn't stand it anymore. Eileen said, no, no. My stepdaughter goes, what about Halloween? She goes, that's the best holiday ever. Just me said, stop it. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm going to post some pictures today. It's not totally done, but y'all know who I do. Court says, good morning, friends. Squinting causes wrinkles, Brooks. I know, but you also told me how to fix that, didn't you, Court K? All right, guys, let's take a second and tell everyone T. G-I-F. Welcome your neighbor, Baptist Church style. Who's next to you? So glad you guys are here. You know, we're live every morning at 9 a.m. Tulsa time, Central time. I try to be as prompt as possible, but if you don't get a notification, you can do like our friend Sweet Toughness that says, I have an alarm set on my cell phone. That's a way to do it. I love it. Hello, Nini. How are you, honey buns? Shep is in here. Shep, yo stranger. Tiff is in the house. Whew. Let me tell you what. This is a very hard case to talk about, even though a miracle happened. Because both boys that were abducted were found safe. They call it the Missouri Miracle. Sean Hornbeck was 11 years old when he was kidnapped. He was riding his bike to his friend's house near Richwoods, Missouri. Now, this isn't unusual. He rode his bike a lot. He rode his bike to his friend's house a lot. And vice versa. He wasn't the only child out riding a bike. He'd taken this trip many times. But on this day... Sean passed by Michael Devlin. Michael Devlin, <laughs> well, he has a fitting last name. Look at that piece of shit. He's a devil. He's a demon. He's a sadist. He's a deviant. So as he's riding his bike, Michael Devlin bumped him with his truck. Devlin initially seemed concerned for Sean's safety, but moments later put him in the back of his truck and told him, you were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. He was looking for a boy to kidnap. Sean's parents, Pam Akers and stepfather Craig Akers, may he rest in peace because he has passed away, 
there they are on the screen. Let me tell you what, these two almost bankrupted themselves. They took money from their retirement, anything they could do to find Sean. And even though at this time, social media wasn't near as prevalent as it is now, people were still blaming them. They were wearing their feet to the bone, putting up flyers. Sound familiar? Sean's parents, Pam Akers and stepfather Craig, focused all of their time looking for their son. They even set up a foundation to look for missing and abducted children, which they called the Sean Hornbeck Foundation. Both Sean's mother and stepfather spent all of their money retirement savings, etc., looking for Sean. They paid investigators to help. But Sean would remain missing for four years. Sean was physically abused and essayed throughout his time living with Mike Devlin. Sean said that Devlin had guns and would threaten to murder him if he ever thought about leaving or calling for help. Eventually, and this is hard to even say, eventually, Sean became too old for Devlin's tastes. And Devlin decided to find a replacement for Sean. So Devlin... There he is again. Devised a plan to kidnap another child. He kidnapped 13-year-old Ben Ombi on January 8, 2007. But this time someone saw. A neighbor saw Devlin's truck and knew something was wrong when he saw Ben crying and the truck peeling out from the bus stop. The neighbor was able to give the police a description of the truck and the FBI was able to link the truck to Devlin relatively quickly. When the FBI came to the piece of shit's house to question him about the kidnapping, Devlin seemed distant and nervous and kept referring to his godson named Sean. Well, the FBI quickly realized that the Sean he was talking about was Sean Hornbeck. Now, throughout the years, Sean's parents were told he's likely dead. A hunter will probably just come across his remains. Psychic Sylvia Brown said he's dead. But they were not going to stop. And it is is a miracle. This channel called Dark Disappearances, I'm going to put the link in here for you guys to go subscribe because I like to give credit where credit's due. And this channel did an amazing job of breaking down the case. Also, we have new people in here. They may not be chatting, but they are definitely watching who are very familiar with the case. I'm not going to air their business. So let's keep it cool. We have a spine-chilling true crime story that will leave you on the edge of your seats. It's the story of Sean Hornbeck. It was a seemingly ordinary day on October 6th, 2002. At around 1.15 p.m., 11-year-old Sean set out on his lime green bicycle to visit a friend's house near Richwoods, Missouri a small town just outside of St. Louis. Sean always took the same route and his parents trusted him to ride alone. Little did he know that this fateful bike ride would change his life forever. While on his way, Sean was struck by a man driving a white truck, later identified as Michael Devlin. Devlin pretended to be concerned about Sean's well-being, but quickly snatched him and drove off, leaving the boy's family in a state of panic. And Sean fought back. But remember, it's, it's on a rural road. And imagine what he said to him. Imagine. You were in the wrong place at the wrong time.
On that fateful evening, Sean's parents initially assumed he might have lost track of time and was running late, so they weren't immediately alarmed when he didn't return home. However, as 45 minutes passed and their 11-year-old boy was still missing, a sense of unease settled in. Pam, Sean's mother, had a strong maternal intuition that something dreadful had occurred. Without wasting any time, she and her husband Craig hopped into their car and combed the neighborhood in search of their son. They retraced the familiar path Sean would have taken to his friend's house, hoping to find any clue of his whereabouts. But to their dismay, there was no sign of him. Returning home with heavy hearts, they decided to compile a list of possible places Sean could be and gathered relevant phone numbers to contact. As they made the distressing calls, it became painfully evident that Sean had never arrived at his friend's house that night, intensifying their worry and anxiety. Despite using all their resources and making numerous media appearances to raise awareness, Sean's parents still couldn't find him. In a desperate attempt for help, they even appeared on the Montel Williams show. Unfortunately, during the show, the self-proclaimed medium Sylvia Brown falsely informed them that their son had passed away, adding to their pain and heartache. But little did they know that Sean was being held captive in an apartment just 40 miles away from home. Well, not only did the psychic tell them that, but the authorities, that after all the time that has passed, the likelihood of finding Sean alive is like slim to none. That Sylvia Brown should have been put in jail for what she was doing to these families. I'm telling you right now. I'd have sued that blonde wig off her head. Contrary to the false information provided by Brown on national television, Sean was alive. Michael Devlin took him to an apartment in Kirkwood, where he remained captive for the next four years. During this period, Sean endured physical abuse and constant threats of harm if he attempted to seek help or escape. Initially, Devlin's sinister plan was to assault and then kill Sean, disposing of any evidence. However, Sean proved to be remarkably clever and desperate to survive. He made a courageous plea to his captor, expressing that if his life were spared, he wouldn't resist and would comply with whatever Devlin demanded. Miraculously, this plea worked and Sean's life was spared. During the first month of captivity, Sean endured horrific conditions. He was restrained and subjected to torment, with his sleep interrupted every 45 minutes. Devlin's manipulation was relentless, convincing the vulnerable 11-year-old that attempting to escape would result in the death of his entire family. Now let's talk about this because my opinion is when the boys were rescued, it's a total miracle, but the talking heads, quote unquote, experts on the TV were not very fair with Sean, okay? He was sleep deprived, starved, essayed, intimidated. He knew that this man had intentions of killing him, but they're saying he could have escaped at any time. They said he could have escaped at any time. We're going to get to that. And what they put his parents through is horrible. You're seriously going to blame these parents because their son was riding his bike? What is wrong with this world? You're going to blame a parent because a child is playing outside? I think the people that point those fingers, they do it because they know they are failures as parents on their own end. And it makes them feel better. The fear and terror inflicted on Sean were unimaginable, especially at the hands of an adult. While physically no longer confined, Sean remained imprisoned by the emotional power Devlin held over him. Despite being granted certain freedoms like watching TV, using the telephone, and accessing the internet, Sean didn't seize these opportunities to reach out to his parents or the police. Devlin's constant threats, along with the presence of guns in the home, instilled a paralyzing fear in Sean, 
convincing him that Devlin would carry out his threats and harm his loved ones. In his darkest moments, Sean sought solace in prayer, holding on to the belief that his parents still loved and missed him. Though he desperately yearned to be rescued, the fear of repercussions if he tried to escape was too overwhelming to overcome. However, there was a glimmer of hope when he stumbled upon his parents' missing persons website during an internet search. Wanting to know if anyone was still searching for him, Sean left a message using the pseudonym Sean Devlin, posing a poignant question to his desperate parents. How long will you keep looking? Sadly, his messages were dismissed as spam, and his cry for help remained unheard. I've always wondered if this was truly Sean reaching out to them, or if it wasn't Michael Devlin. They both had access to the same electronics, and Michael would have known if Sean was trying to reach out to his parents. And well, he would have been really, really pissed. Angie Baby said, why blame parents? They're doing everything in their power to find them. We're witnessing it right now with the Michael Vaughn case. His parents cannot get a fair break from some people at all. Who lets their kid go outside to play with other kids? Who lets their kid go outside and not check on them? My question is, who's got eight sets of eyes, eight sets of arms? We're not octopus. Of course our kids play outside. It's very upside down. Over the course of the four long years in captivity, Sean had occasional brief moments outside the confines of the home. During these outings, he interacted with neighbors and people in the community, yet none of them recognized him from the missing person posters. He had adopted the alias Sean Devlin, claiming to be homeschooled by his father, who was, in reality, his captor. While trying to pass the time, he would sleep and play video games, although these moments were often interspersed with abusive episodes. A shocking revelation emerged from Sean's abduction. Despite being a missing child actively sought by law enforcement, he had multiple interactions with the police during those four years. Around 10 months after his abduction, he even filed a police report about his missing bike. At the station, he introduced himself as Sean Devlin, stating that his bicycle had been stolen from the apartment building he supposedly lived in. He made no indication that he was, in fact, the missing child. You guys know I back the blue. I do. I think our law enforcement deserves more money, more help, more credit. But when I see a case like this and they're having interactions with him, how did they not recognize him? Now, if they were having interactions with him, let's say in Laredo, Texas, I could see them not... Um, really thinking anything of it, but he was right there. On another occasion, on September 29th, 2006, an officer stopped Sean while he was riding his bike at night due to his dark clothing and lack of reflectors. Once again, Sean provided the name Sean Devlin and even offered a birth date of July 7th, 1991, just 10 days off from his actual birthday. Despite his case being widely publicized by this time, the officer did not recognize him as the missing child, and no further action was taken. These encounters with the police, where Sean was alone and had opportunities to reveal his identity, highlight the extent of manipulation employed by Devlin. It's likely that the fear of retribution, with Devlin threatening to kill him if he attempted to escape, was enough to silence Sean and prevent him from seeking help. The chilling reality was that Sean's life hung in the balance and any escape attempt could have resulted in deadly consequences. Then, on January 8, 2007, Devlin made a grave error. As Sean was getting older, he no longer fit Devlin's preference, prompting him to seek another victim. He spotted 13-year-old Ben Ownby standing alone at a bus stop in Beaufort, Missouri. Acting impulsively, Devlin snatched Ben and forced him into his white truck, not bothering to ensure that no witnesses were present. Fortunately, Ben's friend, 15-year-old Mitchell Hultz, witnessed the abduction and promptly called the police. 
providing them with a description of Devlin and his truck. Ben was known as a responsible straight-A student who always informed his parents about his whereabouts and expected return time. When he didn't come home after school, his parents sprang into action, immediately contacting his friends and neighbors to gather any information they could. It was during the search that they learned about the sighting of a white truck driving erratically away from the bus stop, leading them to suspect Ben's abduction. Given the nature of the crime, the FBI swiftly joined the investigation, leveraging the detailed witness account to identify the truck involved. After Mitchell's report, the FBI received a tip that a truck matching the description of Devlin's was parked at a pizza restaurant in Kirkwood. The truck's owner turned out to be the pizzeria manager, Michael Devlin, whose vehicle matched the description. Two FBI... We had a woman in chat earlier today and someone she knows worked with Devlin at the pizza place. And don't be hating on the pizza place, because let me tell you what, anytime I'm in the St. Louis area, my husband will tell you, DT will tell you, I have to have me some Amos pizza. That is some amazing pizza. He'll even go and get the cheese for me. Hey, just me, how often do you guys have Amos pizza? Tropicana Banana said Sean is part of my family. Oh, honey. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry for what your family went through, honey. My agents decided to approach Devlin at his workplace to question him about the bus stop abduction. They requested permission to search his truck, and he consented. While one agent searched the truck, Devlin nervously sat in the back of the FBI car, struggling to answer the other agent's inquiries. He even mentioned having to get home to his son, Sean. As the questioning intensified, Devlin eventually broke down and confessed. He admitted to having Ben Ownby at his apartment, alongside Sean Hornbeck, who had been missing for over four years. Devlin remorsefully referred to himself as a bad person. When the FBI broke down Devlin's apartment door, they found Sean and Ben sitting on the couch playing video games. On January 12, 2007, Sean's parents, Pam and Craig, received a phone call that seemed almost unreal. The incredible revelation hit them like a shockwave. Their son had not only been found, but he was alive. It was the best news they could have ever hoped for, yet it shook them to their core. After enduring over four years of captivity at the hands of a monster, Sean had somehow survived and was finally ready to be reunited with his family. For Sean, the journey was just beginning. He needed extensive therapy to help him heal from the traumatic past. I've lived two lives. I had to start over again from when I was kidnapped. That life's gone, so I'm picking up this life again. He courageously shared his story on various talk shows, such as Oprah, recounting how he clung to hope and prayed to be rescued while in captivity. The thing I remember most is before I left, my mom gave me a hug and a kiss. Tell her I love her and then I'm off. Now that he was back home, there was much to catch up on. His parents had kept his bedroom untouched, awaiting the day of his return. However, many other things had changed, including the growth of his childhood friends and the marriage of his big sister. Sean also spoke about Ben Ownby, the other boy who had been abducted and remained mostly quiet during their captivity. He expressed gratitude that Ben held on during those trying days, acknowledging the shared pain they endured. Sean felt deeply sorry for what Ben had gone through, as he had vowed to prevent other children from experiencing the horrors he faced. He expressed relief that Ben was back with his family. As for the sinister figure behind it all, Devlin faced numerous charges, including kidnapping, molestation, and use of a deadly weapon. With overwhelming evidence against him, he pleaded guilty and received multiple life sentences for a total of more than 4,000 years, ensuring that he wouldn't be eligible for parole until the age of 100, a measure to prevent his release. In 2011, he suffered a violent attack by another inmate who stabbed him with a homemade weapon, likely due to the nature of his heinous crimes. <laughs> Sorry, Devlin. Nobody cares. Yep, in 2011, he was. 
Yep. He was repeatedly stabbed by Troy Fenton, who called his two homemade knives, Sean and Ben, who are the names of the two boys kidnapped, of course. Old Troy Fenton had no shits to give. He carved him up, but he survived. Devlin was then placed in protective custody to live out his sentence. After their ordeal in captivity, Sean and Ben tried to move forward with their lives while residing in the St. Louis area. Sean eventually got married and became a father, embracing the opportunity to build a new chapter. Thank you for joining us on this emotional journey through Sean's story. If you found this video... Absolutely horrific what they went through. And horrific how Sean's parents were targeted by so many people that are just freaking nasty and um, can't understand normal thinking, if you know what I mean. And then the media blaming Sean. You could have left. You had a way to reach out. And my understanding is both of them are doing well. Ben has stayed out of the spotlight. Wiz said his bedroom was the same as when he was kidnapped. Yes, and they he came home to Christmas presents, um, birthday presents, This is when the boys were found. This is the press conference, part of it. A lot of people here are wondering, did Sean post things on a website um, after this press conference? If you please give us some time to sit. When Sean's ready, you know, he'll, he'll be able to talk to you and tell you what he wants to tell you. Um, but if you would just please give us a little bit of time to get to that place, we would definitely appreciate it. Um, you know, we, we need some time to be together as a family and to, to deal with all of this. It actually really puts me in a state of shock that actually this would happen in this tight little neighborhood like this. And I've actually probably seen him before and maybe even talked to him and not even re realize that that's who it was. And just, it actually kind of, you know, puts some, some kind of fear about, you know, just having my kids just around all the time and just, you know, just makes you, it really puts you back into, uh, you know, reality. Yeah, it's a crazy world. Try not to shoot my coffee cup there. Okay? I try to stay away from that. I appreciate that. He rides his bike. He hangs out. He seems to be seems to be a good boy, man. I never noticed he goes to work or not because we work real early in the morning. But the guy, you know, if he's as long as his parking spot's clear, the man will come to his parking, go inside his house, and you won't ever see him again. I've been here for about a year, and that's been the that's been the whole the whole case with him here. We met him, I guess you called him. Yeah. And uh, this is Mike Rapel, you we still got quite a bit of work to do on Mr. Devlin. Uh, obviously, we need to know a lot more about his background. Uh, we'll probably start doing that along with the Bureau next week. Uh, so there's there's a lot of legwork that needs to be done. You know, the case, as far as we're concerned, is, is at a, a, a successful conclusion. But uh, there's still a lot of groundwork needs to be done, a lot of legwork. So they can see you. <laughs> they want to see. Yeah, they want to see. Uh... 
he doesn't want us to hold on to him, but <laughs> we have. Uh, just we're just excited and happy to have him at home. Where were you when you heard the news? How did you contact you when you first held that again and it's going to uh, we were in the middle of a, an interview and uh, uh, Officer Copeland came in and we went in and talked to him and then uh, we come to the, sh the sheriff's department and Ben came in and we grabbed him and <laughs> didn't let him go. <laughs> what are these situations and haven't had the, the resolution that, that you guys have had? He's, he's Ben. He's, <laughs> he's Ben. The first thing we asked him what he wanted to do when he got home and he said he wanted to play computer games. So, <laughs> you know, so when we got home, he, he uh, got him something to eat and then he was sitting there next to me knew, knowing that I probably didn't want him to leave. And I looked at him, I says, do you want to go to your room? And he said, yeah. <laughs> All right. Appreciate your uh, attention. And like I said, we appreciate it. So kind of leave the family rest for a couple of days and thanks on the privacy. Horrible, horrible. And I'm not going to show the full press conference because the media in the presence of the children were asking very sensitive questions. And it was put out in the press conference that through medical examinations, they found Devlin's, and I have to watch how I say this because we're on YouTube, DNA and I'm not going to say which one, in one of the boys' throats. Right in front of the children. I could not believe they would ask that in front of the kids. Like they haven't been through enough. We say often on this channel, see something, say something. Well, this gentleman certainly did, and the FBI jumped right in and saved both the boys. Awesome. Good job. Thank you. We'll see you guys soon. Well, Ben got off the bus first, then... And then about 50 feet, the bus dropped me off. I got in my truck and was coming down the hill and was coming down the hill and uh, I seen a white Nissan pickup sideways in the road and it took off flying down the hill and it pulled in my neighbor's driveway and I pulled up in our driveway and it backed up and took off and that's the last time I seen it. So, so I mean, as far as your, I mean, I mean, you didn't think, did you think of Ben right then? What what happened there? Uh, I didn't even think, it didn't even dawn on me look, to think that Ben was gone or anything. So they can see you. <laughs> they want to see you. Yeah, they want to see you. <laughs> and haven't had the, the resolution that, that you guys have had. Sean posts things on the website um, after this press conference. If you would please give us some time to... I'm I'm just glad I saved them. Yeah. I did what I did. Appreciate your uh, attention and like I said it, we appreciate Thank it. You so kind of leave the family rest for a couple of days and think. We're talking about an emotional attachment and the emotional bond that was created between the child and his abductor. So it makes it difficult to move away from um, that person. It makes it difficult then to go out and try to alert someone that I'm not supposed to be here. Um, it's very, very much similar to um, uh, children who have been abused and still cling to the abusive parent or, um, you know, spousal abuse, where the person may go to work and come back every day. And you say, well, why don't that person leave? But you stay in because of that, you know, um, feeling afraid of that your life is threatened, 
and being spared all at the same time, you know, your life is in this person's hands. What do you have to say, Devlin? That fat sack of shit. Look at what he did to these two boys, to their families, to the community, to his co-workers, to the people that lived in the apartment complex. All the lives affected. And back in the day when this was going on, the mainstream media actually cared about children. Okay? I know that's a, that's a big... Uh, Hammer, I'm dropping on you right now. But Good Morning America, The Today Show, CBS This Morning, they were all over this case. All over it. Now a child goes missing, they're not going to touch it. It becomes a Dateline series sometimes. But Devlin had attempted this before. Check this out. It's become known as the Missouri Miracle. Two teens found together after being abducted nearly five years apart. Right now, Michael Devlin is doing life for kidnapping Ben Ownby and Sean Hornbeck. The case is coming back to life tonight because of a web search in Canada. New at 10, Russell Kinsell is live downtown. And Russell, what's behind this man's search? He says he's haunt, has haunting memories of Devlin. That's right. Kevin Palmer of Ontario, Canada, has reached out to the FBI office here in St. Louis seeking an investigation and charges involving an attempted abduction of him when he was only 14 years old. It's remarkable how he only recently discovered who it was who tried to snatch him off the street and the emotional toll it's taken on him. I got a very good look at his face and I will never, never forget that ugly face of his. It's almost. So he had attempted this before. When someone gets caught, it's not the first time they've done something, okay? He had attempted it before. Too remarkable to believe not one but two missing boys found alive together in the same apartment. In 2007, police found abducted teens Ben Ownby, who'd been missing four days, and Sean Hornbeck, who'd been missing four years in Michael Devlin's Kirkwood apartment. Devlin was arrested and convicted. But now Kevin Palmer is trying to come to grips with the encounter he says he had with Devlin in 1998. Devlin is answering for what he did to those other two boys. And I feel that, and I feel you know what, to me, for my own peace of mind, he's got to answer for what he tried to do to me. In December of 1989, Palmer was visiting Robinson, Illinois, with his father and stepmother, who was from there. While walking back from a video rental store, he says a man in a pickup pulled up. Offered me a ride and said, okay, we can I'll give you a ride in my new truck. It'd be nice and warm. I'll drive you home. Palmer was only a half a block from the house and said, no thanks. And I just wanted to walk away. And the guy just, he got upset. I don't know, irritated. He said, nah, nah. And I'll never forget this. He said, nah, boy, just get in the truck. He says he ran home and a police report was made. The years passed and the memory faded until July of 2020. Palmer says he was reading stories online about kidnapped children who escaped and came across Sean Hornbeck's story. Then he saw Devlin's photo, a face he says he'll never forget. I just remember yelling out. I was scared of waking up my dad. I said, well, that, that, that's him. It was the same guy from, uh, from Robinson. Retired Franklin County Sheriff Gary Telke was at the center of the investigation. Ownby was kidnapped in Franklin County. During the uh, investigation, we found out that um, he did go looking for other children. And he had um, about a 60-mile radius around the area where he lived. Uh, of course he did. He's a ped. He's a deviant. He essays boys. Think about it when, and this is the court documents, when Sean got too old for his, in quotes, case, he had to find another boy. That's when he got bent. going over into Illinois and into Missouri. Palmer has reached out to the FBI in St. Louis seeking an investigation and charges against Devlin for the 1998 incident to get justice and peace of mind. But it's funny, 
who that guy was and what he did to two other kids and the fact that he would have done the same thing to me, that, that's, that was more traumatizing than the original event itself. I contacted the FBI. They told me they can neither confirm nor deny a complaint's been filed and they've launched an investigation. But Palmer's gone so far as to go to court and sign a sworn affidavit that his claims are true. Live downtown, Russell Kinsall, News 4. Yeah, you can't tell me he didn't try this before. Uh-uh. No, of course. Connie Branch said, how long was Ben missing? A few days and Sean was missing four years. Okay, a little bit more <laughs> on the sicko. This is when he pled guilty. Okay, Mr. Devlin, my name is Judge Tobin. You're here for a preliminary arraignment. Mr. Devlin, how do you wish to plead to this matter? Mr. Devlin? I'm not guilty. Okay. Well, he pled not guilty, but when confronted with the medical evidence and the boy's statements, he pled guilty. He got like 4,000 years in jail. Now again, what these parents went through. As we all know, we would give our last penny to our children. We know it. We know what we do at Christmas time. You know, your child wants something. You're going to figure out a way to get it done. Sean's parents drained their retirement, their savings, Everything they had, hiring private investigators to aid the police. They were going on talk shows, putting out tons of flyers. They didn't even care what people were saying about them. And there were some nasty ass people out there. Nasty. Saying that his stepfather did it. Well, he didn't. So they go to the Montel Williams show and speak to a psychic. Much like the Cleveland kidnappings, the same psychic told Amanda Berry's mother that she was dead. Well, she died not too long after that. They were put through the same thing by the same psychic. I'd have sued the hell out of Montel. But, of course, they're going to use the it's for entertainment purposes only clause. Please welcome Sean's parents, Pam and Craig, to the show. You have done everything, almost everything conceivably possible to at least try to find a clue, something from organizing search parties and the community has gotten involved and still yet not even a whim. Is there? Is there any whim at all of what happened? There's absolutely no evidence to support any any kind of theory. He left the house. I'm sorry. He left the house at what time? 1.15. And there were some children who said that they saw him at what time? Around four. There's been sightings up to 4.30. But he was only traveling to a friend's house, which was seven-tenths of a mile away, so he could have gotten there in five or six minutes. So what do you think? And none of his other friends anywhere in, around saw him, correct, between that time? No, most the friends that he played with normally on a regular basis didn't see him that day. Um, there were just some other kids that he normally didn't play with that have seen him. Who, does, who did he know? Or who do you know of by the name of Keith? Keith? Is it a kid or an uh, adult? No, no, it's a young kid. 
Because there's somebody by the name of Keith, the blonde kid, who saw him after this 4.30 period. Doesn't, doesn't ring any bells. Well, have well to I'd ask. Out. Ask around, because he doesn't live that far from where the friend is. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. He wasn't a best friend, but he sort of goes in and out of the group. Because he was picked up in a, in a blue-colored sedan by um, a guy by the name of um, Michael. And the last name sounds like... Is this somebody who lives in the area? Somebody passing through somebody the area? Somebody passing through the area. So was it that area. Sorry? What was that question? Was it anybody that Sean knew? No. Was he? Okay, so she's right about the name Michael, and she's right that it's nobody Sean knew. Blue sedan, I don't know where she got that. We know what he drove. Abducted when you say picked up? Yeah, abducted, yeah. He was grabbed. Grabbed. Is yeah. there any better description of the vehicle other than just a blue the sedan? The vehicle is a blue sedan, and I think it's a Chevrolet. Uh, it's an older Chevrolet. It reminds me of what I had years ago, you know, with sort of with the tail fins on them, which was what, around 58, 59? So an old model car. Old model car. I think they called them, what were they, Impalas? Were the Impalas? Yeah. Pretty sure it was Impala. Is there any kind of a description of the person driving the car? Yeah, the the guy was um, dark skinned, um, although he wasn't black. He was more uh, Hispanic looking. Um, She's freaking crazy, and Shep Bingo, that's like saying I think his name is John. Okay, Michael's a very common name. And I don't know what the deal is with her and Hispanics, but she'll always be careful to say, not black, but Hispanic. This guy is whiter than Wonder Bread. Are you kidding me? Look at that. He's like the starter batch for sourdough. He's white. Um, had uh, real long dark hair, and strange enough, Hispanic, but he had dreadlocks. Um, Hispanic with dreadlocks. Can anybody see dreadlocks on Devlin? Look at that. The hell is she talking about? She was so mean to these families. He was um, really tall and really almost like what you think a basketball player is filled with me. Can you tell how far from the area he was taken? So we're looking for a Hispanic basketball player with dreadlocks. And we have a short, fat, white dude. What? We go from a Hispanic basketball player with dreadlocks in a blue sedan named Michael. Good guess on that one. To this short, fat, white, dumpy guy. Maybe about 20 miles. But he's still within a 20 mile radius even he's now? He's still within a 20 mile radius of, let's say, here's where you are, 20 mile radius. But it's really southwest of where you are. Southwest. So whatever is southwest, because it looks like this is, here we go again with the wooded, with the, you know, the wooded area. So southwest of you. Is there any landmarks around? Yeah, strangely enough, there are two jagged, boulders which look really misplaced because everything is trees and then all of a sudden you've got these stupid boulders sitting there and he could be found near he's there. near the boulders is he still with us do you see the bicycle anywhere they said is he still with us and she shakes her head no no 
Now, for those of you that know the area, where's the wooded area with the two big boulders? I know just me knows the area. Do you know of a wooded area with two big boulders? He was found in an apartment complex. Big difference between a brick apartment complex and a wooded area with two big boulders. It's very irresponsible. I think the See, here's what's strange. I think the, the, the bicycle is in another state in a dump. Let me take a little break. We'll be back right after this. And look at his mama breaking down. And she's sitting there watching that. She's watching this woman fall to pieces. Montel, she needed more than a break. She needed to be in jail. That's insane. You would do that to someone. You got people calling me a tragedy pimp. What is that bitch? I did think it was funny when she was scratching her head and I could see her wig move. <sighs> you know, and the hits just kept coming. For Sean and family. This is a surveillance video put on my Fox St. Louis. You can clearly see Sean with Devlin. There's no sound. You just have to watch it. Okay, there he is with Devlin, right there. Late night television. Well, late night for me, like seven, eight, nine o'clock. Picked this apart. Picked this apart. Now, we know in the case of Elizabeth Smart, she had opportunities to scream and yell. But she didn't because she was scared. J.C. Dugard and there are others. Is it because Sean's a boy? That they were so hard on him? One expert even accused Sean of kidnapping Ben.
Now that is scary. Imagine, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm at the store shopping and everything, I'm not scanning all the faces and everything. I'm not. But this was picked apart like crazy people. Crazy people. One was Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly was horrible to Sean. And I'm going to say this. Oprah was horrible to Sean. She asked him over and over, why didn't you just leave? Why didn't you call for help? Impact segment tonight, the disturbing case of the two kidnapped boys in Missouri. As you know, police found 15-year-old Sean Hornback in an apartment of 41-year-old Michael Devlin last week, along with 13-year-old Ben Ownby. Both boys had allegedly been kidnapped by Devlin, who ran a pizza place in the town of Kirkwood. Sean had been missing for four years, and the question is, why didn't he escape when he could have? There are all kinds of theories about that. Joining us now from Washington, Greta Van Susteren, who had been out to Missouri reporting on the case. All right. Um, you know, the Stockholm Syndrome thing, I don't buy it. I've never bought it. I didn't think it happened in a Patty Hearst case. I don't think it happened here. Too late well, development. Right off the bat. Right off the bat, Bill O'Reilly. And because he's been saved, don't think that he's not aware of what people are saying about him. Don't think his parents aren't following the news. Of course they are. It's their life. I hate when people say, well, then they don't need to watch it. Then they just need to turn it off. It's their fucking life. Could you imagine if someone is doing a show about you, your family, your abducted child, that you're just going to turn it off? No, it's your life. Right off the bat, he comes out and says, I don't buy it. Four years, and the question is, why didn't he escape when he could have? There are all kinds of theories about that. Joining us now from Washington, Greta Van Susteren, who had been out to Missouri reporting on the case. All right. Um, you know, the Stockholm Syndrome thing, I don't buy it. I've never bought it. I didn't think it happened in a Patty Hearst case. I don't think it happened here. Too late well, developments. Uh, can I just say, yeah, just can I say one right thing in. in response to that? Is sure. that, first of all, you know, we don't know exactly. We don't know all the facts, but don't forget that Elizabeth Smart likewise had an opportunity to leave and did not. She was on the public street for some reason when, when young people are picked up and taken under the influence of adults, uh, they are very receptive of what the adults do. So I would not so quickly dismiss the Stockholm. And remember, he was a kid when he was picked up. He's 11. Okay. Um, but the difference in the Smart case, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that this guy was always hovering around uh, the little girl. And she wasn't gone for the uh, long period of time as this uh, guy was. Now, what we have learned, and this is why I don't believe... Greta looks like she's about to stroke out. Look at her eyes. They're like, are you serious? You seriously brought me on to do this? Even the Stockholm Syndrome. It's this guy, Sean Hornbeck, gone four years, 11 to 15, Authorities actually say he taunted his own parents on their website. He, uh, you know, has got the piercings. He's, I mean, this is a troubled kid. In I, would, my I, wouldn't I wouldn't, the piercings, I mean, look, a lot of kids pier do piercings and don't do. Lots of kids do piercings and things like that. And remember, grooming, grooming, grooming. Devlin to keep Hornbeck doing what he wanted him to do. And I don't want to be graphic about that. You know? You get a kid an ice cream, if you know what I mean. So if he wants a piercing, he'll get a piercing. And anything to change his appearance, really. He knows there's missing flyers out there looking for him. He got him a game box, Get you know. This is unreal that this happened. Unreal. It still makes me so mad even after all these years. Do things like that. As far as the taunting goes on the website, I think what can be established is that I, I that someone on this particular login taunted the parents. Now, was it done from this particular computer? If it was done from this particular computer, then that means either Michael Devlin did it, Sean did it, or someone with access to the computer. All right, well, that's, that's, but, but that's, I think good. That, that's a good but, point. But he's also, I mean, let, let, let's not forget, he's a kid. He no. may be 15 now. I'm not, but... I'm not buying this. If you're, if you're 11 years old or 12 years old, 13, and you have a strong bond with your family, okay, 
even if the guy threatens you this and that, you're riding your bike around, you got friends, the kid didn't go to school, there's all kinds of stuff. If you can get away, you get away. All right, and you're 11. What, Bill, it seems bizarre to me. I agree. It seems bizarre. Why not run? Why not yell? Why not scream? But the thing that I keep going back to is that why, you know, what was Patty Hearst's story? I mean, you know, why did she? I didn't why buy was that Patty Hearst story well, for a second. Why, why was she so willing to sort of, you know, uh, to sign up with her, her uh, kidnappers? And likewise, Elizabeth Smart, you know, she had opportunity. Nice kid. Uh, nice let, family. Let me answer your why question. did she? Why let me was she unwilling question. to run? This yeah. is what I believe happened in the Hearst case and in this case. The situation that Hearst found herself in was exciting. She had a boring life. She was a child of privilege. All of a sudden, she's in with a bunch of charismatic thugs, and she enjoyed it. The situation here for this kid looks to me to be a lot more fun than what he had under his old parent. Do you think being essayed by this dude was fun for Sean? He came from good, loving parents, a good loving home. But Bill O'Reilly is saying, this is after the mall surveillance, this was more exciting and fun. He came from a troubled home. No, he didn't. Both Ben and Sean, the minute they were found, were returned to their parents. What a horrible thing to say. This is something Critical K would say. Honestly, this is something nasty that she would say. She found herself in was exciting. She had a boring life. She was a child of privilege. All of a sudden, she's in with a bunch of charismatic thugs, and she enjoyed it. The situation here for this kid looks to me to be a lot more fun than what he had under his old parents. He didn't have to go to school. Run around, do whatever he wanted. Some kids like school. What? Some kids like school. Well, I don't believe this kid did. Um, and, and I think when it all comes down, what's going to happen is there was an element here that this kid liked about his circumstance. Now, well, right, let's, it let's gets even, Petty Hurst for one second. It gets I mean, even uh, more harrowing uh, <laughs> when the police announced today that they found child porn on Devlin's computer. The alleged Devlin's Devlin's got computer. a problem. He, he's, a, he's a weirdo and he's facing serious criminal charges and he's probably a criminal, uh, but certainly at least it points in that direction. But let's go back to Patty Hearst. You know, this was more exciting. I don't know. I'd rather be, uh, live in a family where I have lots of uh, opportunity You're to play thinking cops logically. and robbers with the kidnapping. You're thinking logically. Well, but, but, Neurotic but people the, are susceptible but to this so kind are you, of you're stuff. Pl you're applying that same sort of thinking to this 11-year-old to 15-year-old, you're thinking logically. You think to yourself, why didn't he leave? That's what most people think, frankly. I had that thought as well. But I think you've got to remember that this is a child. He doesn't, ha you know, for whatever reason, he may have, you know, wanted to be with his kidnapper. Maybe his kidnapper turned out to be, quote, a nice guy or whatever. But this is a kid, Bill. And I think we've got to wait till we get all the facts. All right. It may turn out, you may turn out to be right. I usually I don't do. Know. I usually, uh, <laughs> that usually is what happens. Especially if I'm the wrong, jury. <laughs> if I'm wrong, Greta, I'll, you know, we'll play this tape and uh, you'll get your points. I, at this point, I simply don't know, but I'll, I'll wait for the facts. All right. She should have ripped him a new one. She should have ripped him a new one. You know, and y'all know I like Nancy Grace quite a bit. I do. But she pulled some crap with Elizabeth Smart. I'm not going to talk about the Elizabeth Smart case today. I'm just showing that what these people do to these victims for ratings. You know, on YouTube, they always say, tragedy pimp, tragedy pimp, clicks and views, clicks and views. Ratings, people chasing ratings, whether it's hate, drama, trauma, you name it. Well, you be the judge. You first went missing and literally hundreds of people were out looking for you. Now we know you were being held captive not very far away from your home at all. Did you ever hear people calling out your name trying to find you? There was one time. At that moment, did you want to scream out, here I am, help me? I mean, of course, who wouldn't? How At that moment, when you knew 
People were looking for you. Your parents were there. They were trying to find you. How did that make you feel? You know, I didn't know how big it was and it was it was good to know people were looking for me, but I I felt so far away, you know, I just it didn't really connect at that time and yeah. you know, and I think that and you were such a little girl, Elizabeth. I mean, you were just 14 years old. Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to expect a, a little 14-year-old girl to react the way an adult might imagine they would react under those circumstances. You were afraid, I assume. Yeah. Did your kidnappers tell you they would hurt you or your family if you tried to get away? I, you know, they did. And I really am here to support the bill and not to go into what, you know, what happened to me, what the whole, like, what is in my past, because I'm not here to give an interview on that. I'm here to help push this bill through. And I want you to push the bill through, and I want people to hear your voice. Uh, when we take a look back, there is a shot of Elizabeth Smart, and here she is four years later, and Frank. Okay, so she clearly tells Nancy Grace, I'm not here to go through what happened to me. I'm here to push this bill. She's like, and I want you to. But here's a picture of you in captivity after she just said it. And I want you to. I want people to hear your voice. She puts up her captors to hear your voice. Uh, when we take a look back, there is a shot of Elizabeth Smart. And here she is four years later. And frankly, it's a miracle that she was ever found. You know, a lot of people have seen shots of you wearing a burqa. How did you see out of that thing? You know, I'm really not going to talk about this at the at this time, I mean, that's something I just don't even look back at. And I really, I really, to be frankly honest, I really don't appreciate you bringing all this up. I'm sorry, dear. I thought that you would speak out to other victims. But you know what? I completely understand. A lot of victims don't want to talk about it and don't feel like talking about it. Let's talk about the bill. To Senator Hatch. Senator Hatch, you said you wanted... She's like, I really don't appreciate you bringing this up. But she kind of almost throws it back in her face. I understand. Basically almost shaming her, saying, "You, I thought you would want to speak out to other victims. She was trying to bully her into doing the show she wanted to do. Nancy don't give a shit about a bill. She don't care. She wants to talk about the nitty gritty. She wants to talk about the gruesomeness of what happened to Elizabeth. Well, victims do continue. And they actually advocate for others. This is Sean Hornbeck talking about the girls that were rescued in Cleveland. We did a show about it about a month ago. It was a great show. And he does advocate for victims. You and your family in the past couple of days, but uh, you're not hesitant to speak out about it because uh, this is a good thing. Why, why are you making yourself available um, to talk about your case and this case in, uh, in Cleveland as well. well? I just I just feel like this is going to be a part of my life for, you know, the rest of my life. And I, I feel like that maybe it's part of my mission in my life to reach out there and be able to help, you know, keep the message out there and the awareness of the missing children and the families and how they need to keep the hope up and their strength. And that's why I've been willing to mm -hmm. <laughs> donate my whole day to... Yeah. Uh, keeping awareness and just getting the message out there today. What was your first reaction when you heard about those three women in Cleveland found okay and reunited with their families? Uh, my first reaction was joy immediately. A lot of people ask me, if, every time I hear somebody from the home, if it brings back the bad memories, it really doesn't. 
Uh, actually, the first memory that I think of every time is the first time I see my parents. And just the overwhelmed happiness emotion that I got from that. And I just think to myself, I hope those girls felt that exact same feeling I did because they were never forget. Only a few people can uh, relate to this situation. Um, how do you not give up hope? How did you not give up hope? How did these girls not give up hope? Uh, I, I just always knew my family was out there. I've always had a, a like a psychic connection, you could say, to my mom. We just always been linked to each other, and I could just feel her staying strong for me, so I knew if she's staying strong, then I have to, and you just can't give up hope. You just have to have the faith and just know that one day it will happen. If those families in Cleveland reached out to you, would um, you would you talk back to them and, and relate to them and offer some advice? Yeah, I, I would most definitely take the time to talk to them if they wanted, if they had any questions. Of course you would, and he's also a big advocate for how the media treats victims after they are found. Because we know what happened to Sean. We saw the Bill O'Reilly clip. We know what happened on the Montel Williams show. What happened on the Montel Williams show to Sean's parents also happened to Amanda Berry's parents. She was kidnapped in Cleveland. And I'm glad that he's using his platform to advocate in the right direction. Of, you know, how they could go on, move on with their life. I would be more than happy to talk to them. The offer is always out there. Mm -hmm. From your experience, what's the first step for these girls? Obviously, they've been reunited with their families. But what's next? The next part is, is just living day by day. Um, just stay strong. Don't rush anything. Ever let everything come natural and let it just happen with a, a normal flow. Just, you can't push it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's nice to have stories like this that we can highlight, as you mentioned, that there are definitely other children, other adults out there in this situation waiting to be found. Yeah. Bring attention to that. Um, tell everybody, what are you doing these days? Um, I work at a metal fabbing company. Um, they mount for a machine and weld, and that's what I do. I just have a standard life, you know, 21 year old, got my own car payment, insurance, phone bill, and just living life to how I should be. Oh, all those adult things are so fun, aren't oh, they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love paying the bill. Um, if, if somebody came up to you to ask about um, if you'd ever see yourself now at this point being with your mom and dad, leading a happy life, living day by day. Would you say you thought you'd be here? Yeah, I knew I would be here at one point. But like I said, that's just where you got to keep your head up and stay strong. Because when you start doubting yourself, it's when you start tearing yourself up. Mm -hmm. And you caught my attention when you said hearing stories like this of the three ladies in Cleveland being found, it actually made you happy and didn't bring back any terrible memories so much. No, I mean... It, it brings back thoughts, but then I just have to remember that's in the past. That's behind me now. I, I want to look towards the future and how we can help everybody in the whole area to help each other. It's not even just people that have been kidnapped or taken from their family. Just everybody can be out there and be strong and just help each other out. And that's just where I think about it, and that's why I get happy is because I know that there's true miracles out there that will is it a situation for the for you and for these girls with something you think about every day? Um, I don't really think about it every day. Like, I, I think about how I hope everybody gets reconnected with the family that hasn't taken. But it's something that I don't let drag me down, and I let it. It's not a fallen chance of what happened to me. I just I live my life to how I should be living. Well said. Of all the things thrown your way today. Is there anything that somebody hasn't asked you? Is there anything else that you want to say? Like, um, just really keeping the awareness out there, you know, paying attention to your surroundings. If you're a parent, knowing where your kids are, who they're with. And if you're a kid and you're tired of your mom asking you where you're at every five minutes, you guys keep from her perspective. So that's, that's pretty much my message out there. It's just the community's got to stay together and stay strong. And 
just watch your surroundings, be aware. I imagine holidays like the one coming up on Sunday, Mother's Day, are even special for you now. Oh, oh yeah, I actually told mom that I'm barbecuing for this Mother's Day. Ooh, are you good cook? I have had no complaints, so we'll find out because my dad's a professional at it, so put me up to the real test this week. Awesome. Well, we hope that record stays. <laughs> Kathy said, a lesson in hope. Absolutely. And he must have had some amazing therapists because he said, I, I try not to think about it. It's not a ball and chain on me. Um, obviously, when someone who has been abducted is found, I know that he helped with uh, J.C. Dugard, um, the girls in Cleveland. I'm sure there's others. That's just off the top of my head. Um, of course, it's going to bring back what happened to him. Of course it is. But he's trying not to live in the trauma. He's now married. He has a family of his own, full-time job. His stepfather has passed away, still very tight with his mother. And what happened to these two boys should never, ever happen. Never happen. You know, and I get the adage, people say, oh, you can't take your eyes off your kids for two seconds. Well, true, but it's impossible. Let's start looking at these people that take children they're the bad guys not the parents that were taking a shower or fixing lunch or changing a diaper or on their way to work or mowing the lawn that's crazy that's crazy It's a very backward society we have right now. Just me said, say it louder. You know, I've said many times on this show, I was outnumbered. Three sons. One what, what, what one didn't do, the other one had already thought of. I was outnumbered. It was them against me. One's jumping off the couch onto the other one. They love to do their wrestling moves. One's trying to flush a cat down the toilet. It was something all the time. So this shaming these parents because their child was riding a bicycle or their child was playing with their friends is ridiculous. We need to shame Sacks of shit like this. Old Troy Fenton in the jail, he certainly shamed him with two homemade uh, stabbing utensils he made. You bet. Well, guys, I'm so glad that we finally got to get together and do this show. It's been a long time coming. It's just a hard show for me to do. For one, I'm a boy mom, and it just makes me so mad and so angry as to the way Sean was treated after being rescued. I just couldn't believe it. My face almost fell off as I was watching all this unfold. I'm like, they're really blaming him? They're saying he came from a bad home? His parents basically were living on nothing. From printing flyers, driving around looking for him, hiring private investigators. I mean, the whole nine yards, anything they could think of. Traveling to talk shows, you name it. But you had these pundits saying... Oh, he came from a bad home. He he's he has more fun with this dude. Nah. Nah. Disgusting. All right, you guys have a great rest of your Friday. If I don't see you in Discord, one of the Facebook groups, then I'll see you back here Monday morning. Metabolism Monday. 
We have a members live for Halloween on Tuesday. OJ was, is actually going to be on the show. I'm going to call into my husband for his dad joke. Yes, I am. So you guys enjoy the rest of your day. You enjoy the rest of your weekend. And thank you so much for being here. I know there's a lot of stuff to watch on YouTube, but you're here every day. And I couldn't thank you enough. Hats off to the Mod Squad because I know it's been crazy lately. And always hats off to you for being the best chat and best community on YouTube.